Hey everyone, how's it going? Today we're going to be looking at adding some regression tests to our code. Now, this is part of the Azure Migration series and the code that we've got here isn't fantastic. So one of the first things we want to do is refactor some of it, particularly for later on when we're going to be moving some of our services out into like microservices and other different bits and we don't want everything all clunked up together. So what we want to do is we want to make sure our code is safe and secure for when we do the refactor so that we know we haven't broken anything. The way we're going to achieve that is with regression tests. And they're basically going to say, when we put something in, do we get the same thing out? And does the same stuff happen in the middle? So the function that we're going to be adding a regression test to is the sell items to customer function. And I thought I'd pick this one just because it demos that there's a whole load of stuff going on here. And this is the kind of function that you really want to make sure you're not breaking the functionality of your whole application when you change stuff around in here. So we're going to start by adding a test project. So what we usually do for this, because it's an API, we would have some kind of integration test or end-to-end -end test. But because we're running this in a pipeline, at least for now, it can't access anything. This isn't being hosted anywhere. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to use something that C Sharp gives us called Web Application Factory. And that basically lets you run your app in memory and test against it. So for this, we actually want our own custom web application factory. So here we set up our shop API factory and we're inheriting from this. And what this does here basically is we're overriding the original configure web host that the program calls. And we're for now just going to get it to do what it would normally do um, to make sure that it has the base functionality in there. But we're going to add things to this later uh, and that'll be apparent why we've made our own one. So what we're going to do now is we're actually going to get rid of this. I'm going to paste in a test I already have, and we're going to take a look through it together. So this is declaring our shop API factory, and here's the constructor setting it up. The test itself, what we've got is we're going to get a client from it, and this is actually what you usually have as your HTTP client, but we're telling this to basically give us our fake one, our one that's going to call our API in memory. We'll ignore this line for now, and here is where we're going to do what you would usually do for HTTP call. And we're going to post as JSON async um, to our API endpoint, which is the one that the controller is, is running, this one here. And we're going to post this, this here. Now, this is some data for an order, and I'll, I'll put the function in there in a second, and we'll check that out. And then at the end, we're going to assert that the status code should be OK. And for this, we just need to import fluent assertions, and now that bit's fixed. So what we're actually going to do, I know this sounds counterintuitive, we're going to comment this out for a second, and we're just going to run our shop application. And when we run our application, it's going to give us the Swagger page. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to go hit, and we're going to click on Try It Out. And this is going to give us the JSON it's expecting, so we can copy that. And then back in Visual Studio, what I'm going to do is create a new object, I've called it customer order. Now we're going to do something really cool, which I only learned quite recently in Visual Studio Code. If you go to edit and it won't show up here because it's not showing the right menu, there is a paste special and you can do paste JSON as class. And now it takes all that JSON we just got from the web page and it gives us an object. So we can be sure that when we do a web request, because the controller has a load of input validation built in, we need to send it up everything we need. So now we know exactly what it's going to take because it told us here. So save that and close that. And now we can come back here and we can uncomment that and it understands what customer order is. And the last thing we have to do is implement this function. So I'm going to stick it in here like I've already done before. And we're going to take a look through this. So it's going to create a customer order. It's going to set it up with some details. So we've got the customer's address details. Uh, we've got the item set up, and for now we just care about looking at one to make sure it works. So we're going to say we're going to buy one steel sword. Uh, and is it a tab? So that comes back to our functionality in here, which we can test for to see what happens if it's uh, on a tab or if it's just going to be a sale that's going to be made. So that will get that there, and then this will let us just run it straight against the application. Now, one thing you might be wondering is why are we using this fake customer order in our test environment when the RPG shop itself obviously has a customer order? Now, 
If we have these separately, it means if anything on the main RPG shop project changes, particularly in regards to the customer order, what it looks like or what the actual controller input itself is taking in, we'll be told straight away that something's wrong because what we're giving it isn't going to line up with what it was expecting. So that's why we've got our own one separate here. So we're just going to go full screen in a second because the last thing we actually need to do is to add a project dependency to our RPG shop. And that way it knows that that's the actual program it's looking for. Oh, and one other thing it actually needs is if we go to program, we need to put here in the bottom this public partial class program. And what that will do is basically make the program accessible and you know be able to call it and create it from somewhere else. So now I'm going to run the test. It previously failed because I forgot that part. But should now pass. There we go. So our test is running. It's sending a JSON blob up to the API and it's getting a response back. So everything's looking good. The issue at the moment is that it's still running against our local databases. So in order to fix that, we need to mock the databases. And that means when it runs in the pipeline, it doesn't need to try and talk to anything that really exists because, I mean, it can't talk to my local machine. So to do that, we're going to set up some interfaces because this is what you need in order to create a mock. So this is one for the ISQL database. Uh, we're just going to put it in here. And I do need to make all of these public as well quickly. Now, what you'll also need to do is come to program.cs in our main project and paste these in. And you'll notice I've done one for NoSQL already. And what this is doing is using injection. So it says when we're looking for an ISQL database, actually give us the solid implementation of SQL database. And so we actually need to go to our controller and all the way to the top. And instead of them being set up as new here, we need to take them in. Uh, let's just give them some quick names. And we need to say this one is that. And that one is that. And now these are being injected. So when we run our test, it's getting the actual services that we've set up there. And now they're being injected, we can mock them. So if we go back to our factory, we can add in this. And we're going to use n substitute for this. So let's just import that quickly. And now this has set up a mock for both of these. If we want to go to our configure web host function. And now what we're going to do is tell it to run builder.configure services. Now it's already actually done this at some point, but we're calling it again here because here's where we want to override our functionality. So we want to also put in these. And what these are, these are descriptions of services. And this is basically saying that our mocked SQL database is a type of ISQL database. And if we come down here and we let it include the dependency injection packages, now what this will let us do is actually to say those services you've got, switch them out for these ones. So it's switching out the ones it originally set up, the ones that we declared in the program, and it's giving them our mocks instead. So now they're mocked, everything's great, right? Well, no, if we run our test, our test has actually failed. And if I look at this, we're getting an internal server error. Now, this has happened because it's calling our mocked functions, but they don't really exist. They're not doing anything. So when it tries to get an item from the SQL database, it's falling over. So we actually need to override the functionality of the mocks. So if we come back to our function, we can see that for this test, we have get item by name being called remove stock, add to tab, make sale and add customer details. Now the no SQL ones are actually just recording things at the moment. So it's not going to crash if it, if they don't give anything back to us, because we're not expecting anything back. But the get item by name one is in fact the remove stock one doesn't really need to return anything either. So what we're going to do is we're going to override get item by name. So we can put it in here a mock to say when get item by name is called with steel sword, it returns. And here we've got a little setup that I need to add in as well. And now let's put this in. This is our function to get our test item. And that means that item will be found here and can be used throughout the rest of it. So we run our test now. Actually, it failed again. And a good learning moment here. When I'm passing these in here, I should actually be passing in the interfaces to the shop controller. Otherwise, it's not going to inject anything. And there we go. Now it's using the interfaces instead. Now we can see our test has passed. So what I can also do now is post this in and say, if you give it a bad item name or an exception, and we can go back to our tests. And we can add another test in right here. 
and this says if you give it a bad name we're going to expect not found to be returned and there we go that passed too so now we've got a good test and a bad test but that doesn't necessarily cover everything that's going on particularly for us because we've got this stuff going on here which is going on behind the scenes so what we can do is we can actually check to see if the right function is being called when we expect it to be. So what we want to do is we want to go back to our factory and we actually want to go down. I'm going to make our mockdsql database public. And what that means is over in here, actually make another test. And I've actually already put a test together. So here we go. Let's look through this. So we've got a couple of test cases. Say is tab. So basically we want to check if the cu the customer's tab is set, we're going to check that add to tab is called. If it's not set, then we can assume make, make sale has been called. And that mimics this here. And what we're doing here is we're actually saying, so for the, let me just check around, for the tab one, we're going to say, has add to tab been called with any argument that's a tab where the item name, the first item name, is steel sword. And similarly for sale, we're going to check if any sale has been received and the first item name is steel sword. And we'll run those, but you know, they're going to pass because I already set it up that way. But we can basically use this to check, you know, have we broken any of the functionality inside? So if I go here and were to comment that one out and run in the test again, the inputs and the outputs, whatever happens are going to be the same. But because the functionality has changed, we need to know about it. And look, now the test is broken because it didn't receive that call to add to tab. So let's put that back in. And this just means if we happen to break any functionality inside of our test, now we know about it. Now, the last thing we want to do is add our tests to the pipeline. So luckily for us, .NET Core has a test functionality in it. So we can go here. Path to our project is actually going to be this here. Uh, we don't need any arguments. Uh, we might as well publish it and we'll add that in. Now, actually, the solution was slightly different because it has this in here. So I'm just going to put for now the whole path in here. And I've updated the path up here for our new directory. So it should just be as simple as that. And now we can run. And there we go. The tests that I've got here have now passed. Now, I appreciate this video has been quite long. So if you've got any questions, you're stuck with anything, leave a comment below and also check out the example code where I've covered the whole project with tests. Thanks very much.